Amen. Amen. Well, I am so glad to be here. It's been two weeks since I was last here in the pulpit, and I feel like it's been two years. Uh, it's just been, it feels like a long time. Today we are continuing in our sermon series. We're actually in the sixth week of our sermon series from the letter of Philippians. If you have your Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to page 1,165 if you're using one of our pew Bibles or Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. And your Bible app, go ahead and flip to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we want to invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. Call it yours. Tear out the page that says Calvary Baptist Church and write your name in it. It's your Bible. We want you to have it. We want you to have a copy of God's Word that you can read and understand easily because we believe if we read God's Word and apply God's Word, He will change our lives. And don't we all want to experience life change? Don't we all want God to change our hearts and change our lives? In fact, many of you maybe are here for the first time today because you're looking for something to change in your life and you're looking for God to change you. When you read and apply God's word, that's what happens. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment when you failed to show love to somebody like you were given the perfect opportunity to show love to somebody. You were given the perfect opportunity to be kind to someone and you dropped the ball and it didn't happen. Raise your hand if you've done that. Thank you. Let me confess my sin to you. Last weekend, my family and I were traveling from a celebration of life in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We were traveling back home. We were in one of the church vans. We made it to Gallup, New Mexico and the engine blew up. I don't know what happened. Something happened. There was oil underneath the car, under the undercarriage, all along the sides of the van, in the back, on the back tailgate of the van. Oil was everywhere. So something pretty bad happened, right? I was standing by the tow truck driver when a man walked over to me with his family and he told me that he had slept behind the dumpster the night before with his family and he's wondering if I could help him and give him a little bit of money. So I said rather hastily, I'm out there with my children, uh, my wife, uh, the van is broken down, I'm making phone calls, and I said, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have any cash on me, our van's broken down, I'm 400 miles from, how, uh, from our house, I can't help you. He walked away. After he walked away, I thought, you know, I could have helped him. I could have done something. I may, not have any I may not have had any cash on me at the moment, but we were right outside Safeway, the grocery store. I, I could have taken him inside and bought him groceries. We were outside a hotel. I could have booked him a room for the night uh, for he and his family. Now, I could have taken him to the burger joint across the street and bought uh, food for his family. But instead... I could only think about the problems that I had going on in my life in that moment. As I think about the Apostle Paul in this sermon series, the Apostle Paul had been arrested for sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. He was chained inside a house for two years, and during that two years' time, Paul could have focused on himself, and he could have focused on his own problems. But as we've looked at over the last couple weeks, Paul stayed focused on communicating the message of Jesus, uh, on communicating life change that happens through Jesus Christ. He could have focused on writing letters to churches saying, hey, I'm in a lot of trouble here. Would you raise money so maybe we can bribe the court system to get me out on time? Uh, he could have said, uh, he, he could have been focused on obtaining legal counsel so that he would have an accurate and a good defense as he stood before the courts. But instead, Paul didn't focus on his own problems and his own challenges. Paul still focused on other people. He still focused on the mission of Jesus and sharing the hope that he had in Christ. So we're going to read together Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes this. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ... 
any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. How could Paul keep his focus on telling others about Jesus when he was in prison himself? When he had many great distractions and obstacles that were going on in his life? How could he do that? How did he not turn inward? Well, I think it's because he understood that unity around the mission results in life change. Unity around the mission results in life change. Paul asked the Philippian believers to have the same mind, have the same love, and focus that being in full accord, same mission. Same mind, same love, same mission. In chapter 1, as Paul began the letter, he said that his imprisonment had actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it had become evident to everybody, the, the Roman guards, the whole palace guard, all the rest, that his chains were in Christ. Paul never took his eye off the mission even when he experienced major changes, major obstacles, major hindrances in his life. And he encouraged the believers to stick together and be unified around the mission. He wanted followers of Jesus to to stay focused on living out the message of the gospel. You know, the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's my mission too. When I came here two years ago, I said, this is also my mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So why did I not help that man and his family out that day? Because I was so focused on my current situation. I was so focused from looking at things from my perspective and not God's perspective. I didn't Understand that God brought that man for me to be able to say, hey man, I don't have any cash, but what I do have, I'll give you. Let me tell you about Jesus. I didn't take that moment to say that because I was so focused on myself, my family's needs. And Paul knew that the Philippian believers might actually start turning inward themselves. And so that's why he encouraged them to not exclusively focus on things that do not matter. He challenged them to have the same mind, the same love, the same mission. And you know, there are churches that are dying across America today because they focus on things that do not matter. They focus on decorations, they focus on property, but they don't focus on the mission to lead people to Jesus. They become so consumed with their preferences, they forget about the power of presenting people with the gospel and seeing life change. The reason I did not help that man and his family in the parking lot that day, in that moment, is because I believe that I was more important than him in that moment. I believe that I was the most important person in that parking lot. I believe that my problems were greater than his and my problems mattered more than his. We were both there with our families. So now I have confessed my sin to you and I hope that you forgive me, but now I have a question for you. Who do you think is the most important person in this room right now? Who do you think is the most important person in this room right now? Now, some might say, well, pastor, you're the most important person because you're teaching us God's word. Uh, All eyes are on me unless you've already fallen asleep. I'm talking to our camera operators. 
some may say that Jesse and our worship leaders are the most important people in the room because they lead us to the throne in worship. Well, if we were to say the pastor and if we were to say the worship leaders are the most important people in this room right now, we would be wrong. The most important people in this room, it's not me. And it's not you. The most important person sitting in this room right now is the person that's sitting beside you or behind you or across from you or at the other end of the aisle. I'm not the most important person. You are not the most important person. It's the stranger in this room. It's the friend that's in this room. Other people are always more important. And that's what Paul is driving home in this passage of scripture. See, if you can agree with me that you're not the most important person in this room, that means your preferences, your wishes, your desires always come in last place to the mission of Calvary. Other people are always more important than yourself. And it's a beautiful concept to grasp because once you can grasp it and once you can begin to live that out, you're going to realize that selfishness and pride hinder unity. Unity for life change, unity around the gospel. If we're really serious about seeing people come to know Jesus as their Savior, if we're really serious about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we're going to discover that selfishness and pride will hinder unity. Paul writes in verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Other people better than himself. Now, Paul was an apostle. The Holy Spirit spoke through him to write letters inspired by God. He was the leading Christian leader at the time. There was none like Paul in the whole Christian world. He was an advanced thinker. He was an incredible scholar. He understood the mysteries of God, and he was ex able to explain those to regular people. The early church probably thought that the Apostle Paul was the most important person. But Paul did not think he was the most important person. In fact, while he was in house arrest, while he was chained up in the house, the Roman guards were more important. He told them about Jesus. The Roman guards' lives mattered. Their eternal destiny mattered more than Paul's life. Paul considered the church in Philippi more important than himself. And last Saturday in Gallup, New Mexico, I did not consider that man as more important than myself. So what about you? Who mattered more than you today? Who mattered more to you, more than you today? So I want us, before we get a little hard on ourselves, I want us to laugh at ourselves a little bit as we think about how often we put ourselves in first place in our own lives. Raise your hand if you've ever been frustrated because your spouse was not ready on time. Someone's loud and proud. They're raising their hand up. Raise your hand if you ever have been annoyed because your spouse did not fill the tank up with gas for the car. Left that thing on E. Raise your hand if you ever got irritated because somebody parked in your spot at church. <laughs> See, we get irritated with other people because we feel like we matter more. Now, I'm not talking about areas of social justice, and I'm not talking about areas where, uh, where there's an injustice that's done and we're defending the rights of somebody that can't defend themselves. I'm talking about everyday living. I'm talking about when the remote control is hidden from everybody, when it's hidden underneath the couch, and all you want to do is turn off the TV, but you can't turn off the TV because now they make TVs without power buttons on them, and you have to have the remote. And you're saying, who has the remote? I don't have it. Stand up. I don't believe you. Move around. Right? Those things. Who's the most important person when you get irritated and when you get aggravated? It's you. 
You're the most, you become the most important person. You matter more. But hey, I'm not mad at you. I'm guilty of these as well. When we're irritated with others, it's often because our desires matter more. And if you really think about the reason why people bother you and annoy you, it's ultimately because in that moment you matter more than them. So let me ask you a question. How important were others to you this past week? How important were other people really to you last week, this past week? Are there people that you got to go back to and apologize? Are there people say, hey, you know what? When I got irritated, when I got aggravated, I was putting my own needs in front of you. And I just want you to know I'm sorry. I'm going to work on that because that is humility. Now, let me just add this caveat. If you think that your spouse ought to wait on you hand and foot and you go home and you say, now, didn't you hear what the pastor said? I'm more important than you. You've got the wrong idea. You're, you're hearing me wrong. I'm saying we can never say to somebody else that we are more important to them. Other people are always more important than us. And Celebrate Recovery meets every Monday night at 630. And if you, if you focus on yourself and selfishness and you really get irritated with other people, then Celebrate Recovery is for hurts, habits, and hangups that you want to recover from. And so no one's mad at you. We want to help you. We're for you. It's hard to be unified around the life-changing message of Jesus if our preferences and desires matter more to you than other people. So treat everybody you see with love. Treat them with kindness. Treat them with gentleness, respect. And I hope you understand that what I'm about to say here is that our community is more important than our church. Hear me? Our community around us is more important than our church building. Our community around us is more important than our church properties. Our community around us is more important. God has put us here to lead people to a life changing relationship with Jesus, and that is our mission, that is our focus. Those without Jesus are more important than those with Jesus. So when you leave today, put the parable in place of Jesus leaving the 99 and going in search of the one. Make sure you demonstrate that you love people and you are seeking to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That happens by leaving a large tip at the restaurant that you go to tonight. That happens by letting other drivers in front of you, even at the light at Mulberry and 95. Okay? The longest light in America. Let God use you to bring peace to our city not to add more stress to people's lives, not to add more uh, uh, worry to people's lives, strife and anger in people's lives. Let God use you as the hands and feet of Jesus to reach our community because you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But there are people around our community that don't. And we need to do everything we can to make sure that we love them and lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. God loves you. God cares for you. But God is going to allow you to choose to be humble or to get humbled. God's going to allow you to choose to be humble, to demonstrate humility, or to be humbled. Are you supposed to be concerned about yourself? Of course you are. Should you be concerned about your family? Of course you are. When you're 400 miles away from home, should you be worried about how you're going to get home? Of course you should. But Paul writes in verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility, genuine biblical humility, is looking out for your own interests and looking out for the interests of others. A truly humble person will care for others and they will care for themselves. 
If all you ever do is take care of other people, but you never care for yourself, it may be because you don't love yourself the same way that God loves you. You don't value yourself the same way that God values you. And if all you ever do is care about your own needs and you do not care about others, you love yourself a little too much. You know, you're too important in your own eyes. You matter too much. And if you're a follower of Jesus, but you struggle with pride, God will help you to be humble by humbling you. First Peter 5, 5 and 6, Peter writes this, and all of you serve each other in humility, for God resists the proud, but favors the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. God resists the proud. God resists the arrogant. God resists those who don't love and care for other people. God resists the proud. If you want to experience blessing in your life, choose to be humble. If you want God to humble you, let God resist you for a while. Let God not give you what you want, your desires, and bless your life. God blesses the humble. He favors the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and he at the right time will lift you up in honor. So when your family is running late, be humble. When you don't get your way, be humble. When things irk you and when things bother you and things get underneath your skin, Choose the path of humility because when believers and followers of Jesus choose the path of humility and when we can focus on our own needs and focus on the interests of others as well, it communicates to a world without Jesus that Jesus has changed our lives. What would it have said to that man if I would have just looked at him and taken some time and said to him, frankly and plainly, man, I, I, I'm not able to help you in this moment, but I can't tell you about Jesus. What would it have said to that tow truck driver that knew I was a pastor at a church in a church van? What would have communicated to him that he said, man, he was able to focus on the spiritual needs of this family. And he didn't worry about what was happening in his own life in that moment. Man, I, I kick myself and I beat myself up all week long for that. And I know God has forgiven me and God loves me and it's a teachable moment for me. So let my teachable moment be a time when you don't repeat the same mistake, right? Don't focus so much on yourself that you miss opportunities to love and lead people to Jesus. You can lead people to Jesus by inviting them to church with you. You can lead people to Jesus by sharing how God has changed your life. And you can love your spouse by not being irritated when you can't find the remote control. Leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus requires love and it requires humility. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on the cross so that you and I could have hope. And if you've never experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus, I want you to know that our prayer team will be here at the front. And a life-changing relationship with Jesus begins first by asking Jesus to forgive. Asking Jesus to forgive you for your sins by humbling yourself and receiving Jesus as your savior, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, believing that he rose from the dead, and believing that one day he's going to return. Proud, pride, proud, prideful people can never surrender their lives to Jesus. It takes a step of humility. It takes a step of faith to say, Jesus, I'm not the most important person in this room. I need you to save me, to change me, and I surrender my life to you. If you've not yet done that, 
Our prayer team will be here at the close of the last song. They would love to be able to lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Thanks for your kindness. Thanks for your forgiveness towards me. And I pray you go out and make a difference in our community. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for grace and we thank you for your kindness that you demonstrate to us. We thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus. And Lord, it's our prayer and our desire that you would continue to show up and change lives today. Father, we, we want to lift up that man and his family to you and, and just pray your blessing on them and on that tow truck driver. And God, use the people in this room to make a difference here in Lake Havasu and in Parker and wherever they're joining us from online. Help us to remember that other people are always more important and to live by the example that Jesus demonstrated by giving up his rights as God and taking the nature, the form of a servant. Father, thank you for life change. Thank you for hope. Thank you for the joy that we have in Christ. And now, oh God, as you've caused us to think, let us worship you, the most important being in the galaxies. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said.